Doreen, do you want to start us? And then I'll swing into the book group part. Sure. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are going to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, Open Democracy acknowledges that we do our work on Indakana, the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the people who have stewarded Indakana throughout the generations and continue to do so today. So let me, am I, okay, I'm not muted. So the three big questions that have guided our book group from the start, which as Olivia pointed out uh, tonight is 15 books ago, um, which is amazing and 600 participants so far. And every, as we started this and every book is like, has this question, well, where are we? How do we get here? And what do we do about it? Um, and we have all agreed in our sort of preliminary conversations that the book tonight, Kristen's book, is particularly helpful in the solutions department. What do we do about it? Um, so we are going to begin. Uh, oh, and the last and another thing to say is this is our last one for 2023. But at the end, Joe will tell a little bit more about what we're going to do. But do you have on this slide, Sarah, is that where we show the book form or is that later yeah um yeah we have a form and i can put it in the chat uh now and then also at the end great so we'll be figuring all that out as as we go along um so uh without further ado i'm going to turn this over to olivia to introduce our author and get us going well well wonderful thank you all for being here and for uh, reading the book. Um, our author tonight is yes. mother and an inspiration to all of us. She has worked um, at the NRDC and the Sunlight Institute. She works on democracy policy and climate policy. Um, she has taught courses on climate change and energy law at Stanford Law and UCLA School of Law. Um, she's a graduate of Stanford um, with her master's degree and is joining us today um, from Oregon. We really welcome her to tonight's book club to share about why she wrote this book. Um, and then she'll take questions from all of you. And just maybe a quick reminder, if we all need to mute, except for Kristen while she's speaking. So thanks for doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for being part of a democracy book club. I love it. Um, and for looking for things uh, that, that we can do to move forward. That was a lot of why I wrote this book. So um, in terms of where we are and how we got here, you know, American democracy was very state of the art in the 18th century. You know, we were really an innovator and a leader, and it was such a big deal, right? It's such a big idea and something that had not been tried. Um, and so we came out of the gate with uh, these interesting ideas and really you know, changed the conversation. But unfortunately, at the federal level, didn't give ourselves a lot of mechanisms for updating. And so now in the 21st century, we are uh, not cutting edge anymore and are, are lagging behind and have a lot of things where I, th I think there's probably in some ways a broad agreement that we could do better, but it's just so hard um, to make it better. And I, you know, the thing that I always think about with the, the founding fathers, they of course were, you know, f fighting for this new country and trying to get it passed through the states. Um, but uh, Jefferson really thought that it should have, the constitution should have a mechanism for updating every 20 years. And that was one of the things that did not make it um, through the compromises that it took um, to get our constitution. And I think about, you know, how, how different it would be if there had been something like that. Because of course, everything has changed so much in the 200 years and there needed to be you know, some stability, but also some more way to update. So we are in some ways um, stuck with some of the um, 
limitations that existed at that time when when this was a new idea you know so at the time it was a, a big idea that the people should have any power at all but of course who the people are had a very limited definition it was land holding white men um and so the idea that you know you should be able to vote was huge and groundbreaking but the the only way they knew was plurality you know one person one vote um the most votes wins which seemed like a great crazy idea at the time, but we now know that there are different and better ways of doing it. So in some ways we're um, uh, victims of our success that we we got this big thing passed and then um, haven't been able to keep it updated. Um, but luckily, although that is very true at the federal level, that is, we have the hardest to update constitution in the world. Um, but at the state and local levels, we do have more of those options um, to, to make changes. And so as a result, we do see um, localities and states trying new things and introducing new ideas and making progress um, in the field of democracy and then there's options, you know, for other states and localities to then take what we've learned in these places and and do the same thing. And, you know, we have experienced that, like, once something gains enough momentum, eventually you might be able to get that reform at the, at the federal level if it becomes just a norm that most people are very familiar with. Um, so just, you know, I'll get into some of the sort of more practical things that I talk about in the book, but one thing that I thought about a lot in writing it was some of these are like very nuts and bolts. You know, we should do this. We should keep track of people's voter registration, right? That makes sense. Why don't we do that? Uh, you know, we should um, let people vote even if they have been convicted of a crime. You know, why why don't places do that? But underlying it all, there is this kind of deeper psychological feeling that uh, I think is important and and that was important for the the beginning of our country this feeling that you belong and that you matter and that your voice matters that's really kind of at the heart of democracy and so these things where we limit who matters or how much they matter or how much their voice is heard cuts all of us because then we have this e even if you are you know one of the lucky ones who's, whose voice does get heard you still see that you live in a place where not everybody is hurt. And that is is diminishing to you too, um, because you have this feeling of there, but for the grace of God go I. Um, and so I think a lot of these reforms, you know, there, there's a certain there's a practicality to them, but there's also this deeper message of are we a country or a state or a locality where we really believe that everybody matters? and everybody should be a part of this thing that we're building together. So um, I don't know if that comes across in some of the, you know, I was really f focused on like, just like, what do we do and how do we make this happen and where is this happening? Um, but it all um, ties together for me in that, um, that deeper uh, message or feeling. Um, so, you know, just thinking about the reforms that are in the, in the book, um, and I think there has been, you know, progress in places even since I published it. Um, but, and I know a lot of you are from New Hampshire, which is a place that has, you know, done well on some of these things. Um, but the, you know, the first kind of category of things around just letting voters vote, uh, you know, this again goes back to like our roots were like, well, maybe some voter, you know, maybe some people get to vote. And I think there has been big progress on that where we are now and um, what we can do. I think that is one of the places where there's um, lots of room, you know, or, or it's one of the easier reforms perhaps in some ways um like joining eric the electronic registration information center is kind of a bipartisan no-brainer like let's let's just keep the voter rolls um clean and then let people vote because we already know that they're on um, on the voter roll um whereas then when you get down to you know some of the the voting reforms like ranked choice voting or multi-member voting, those get to be a harder lift. But, you know, at the same time, Portland, Oregon, where I lived, 
was, uh, you know, just passed multi winner ranked choice voting for city council. Um, the first city in, I don't know, almost 100 years to pass that. And so now there's a question, of course, retaining it because 100 years ago, a bunch of cities and counties um, did try proportional representation. Most of them got repealed. So that's, you know, the first step is is winning the battle. And then the next step is is keeping it. Um, but just the fact that we will now have a new city where we can do this comparison of this before and after, like, what did it mean? What does it mean for who runs and who gets elected and how many people vote and how represented they feel is um, very exciting. And I think is hopefully will be a, um, a motivation or a starting point for, for all of you to go, you know, back to your city and say, Hey, you know, could we try this? Um, this is getting tried um, by other American cities. The other reform that is kind of, you know, the last chapter that's kind of close to my heart, that's a little like less proven, but I feel like has so much potential is the citizen assemblies. And I think part of why it does is because it is a thing that there is like a there is a low stakes startup option, you know, whereas um uh, fixing the Senate is is just like a big all or nothing, you know, ne huge knockdown, drag them out battle, never going to happen. But citizens assemblies, you can start small, right? You can have a citizen assembly on a particular issue. Um, and I think there's like some issues that really lend themselves to doing that citizen assembly, like um, especially good governance issues where it's like uh having a check on the city council, right? So having the citizen assembly be the one that looks at what should we consider for charter um, reforms. So a lot of cities have a charter reform kind of built in, you know, every 10 years or something, you review your charter. And of course, everyone knows that the city council has, you know, a certain interest in uh, particular aspects of the charter, you know, being a certain way. And so having this neutral, you know, citizens assembly say, these are the things that are important for us to look at. And maybe they don't have final say, you know, on what happens. They're just like agenda setting around it. I think that's something that could be uh, very popular and kind of, uh, like I said, low stakes, right? You're not giving them the power to make the final decision, but now you're introducing this idea of like, what is a citizen assembly and how does it work and how do we do it? And then if they do come out with recommendations and those get, you know, a bit of press locally, now you've got press for the idea of a citizen assembly and how it can bring different voices um, to the table. Or similarly kind of checking up on if there is like a scandal or, you know, some kind of uh, kerfuffle over, you know, conflict of interest or um, campaign finance, that's a great time to bring in a citizen assembly to sort of look at that issue independent from the people who were involved in the issue. Um, so I I think there's, you know, the, the good thing here is that there is room for that sort of thing at the state and local level. And I hope that some of the ideas and examples in the book do give some fodder for, you know, have, starting these conversations locally about what what we could do um, differently that, you know, other places are doing, you know, we don't have to be the very first in the, in the world to do it, um, but we could still be a, you know, a, a leader on some of these issues. And um, I'd be happy to to discuss and see um, what was interesting um, to you. Anita? All right, thank you, um, Kristen. Uh, I, I find your, your book fascinating and I, I find it very in depth in, in a lot of different ways. And um, I think there's so many good suggestions in here, and then not not just just suggest suggesting, but but giving us the impetus to um, carry carry something through, um, connecting with some of these groups in our own communities. I'm particularly interested in the citizens assembly, and I wondered if. If you could um, 
describe it a little bit more as to how you know it and and or what are the other communities i mean i how is it even brought together how is it formed i mean so um and what keeps it together um and to to push through a um proposal or a strategy what what do you suggest yeah and like i said the citizen assembly is perhaps one of the less uh you know practiced so the examples uh, that i am familiar with they're all a little different you know there's not kind of a a one uh, way of doing it um, so the one that I'm probably most familiar with is here in Oregon, um, the Citizen Initiative Review. Um, and so it is assembled, um, I think every, I think it was every two years and now it's every four to review a ballot initiative. Um, and so the it's a kind of a one time, it's like a weekend um event so it's just they they're assembled and then disperse it's not like a standing body um and they uh they have this uh great algorithm for picking the people to make sure that they are representative right so they have all the demographic data about registered voters and then and of course in Oregon almost everybody who is eligible to vote is registered because of automatic voter registration um, and they send out postcards to like 10,000 people and then see who they get back, who's interested. And then some people who commit, they sort of check off the demographic boxes for those people and then take people who are too similar to them out of the pool before they send out the next batch of postcards. So that by the end, they end up with um, a sort of statistically diverse in terms of age, education, income, geography, gender, race, um, group of people that really represents all of Oregon. And then um, another thing that they do is they they pay people for their time to try and and, and their travel to try and make it more accessible um, to, to people who can't just volunteer their time to do something like this. And then they staff it. So they have, you know, a professional staff, they have a, a budget for bringing in experts um, and they have professional facilitators to help sort of facilitate the conversation so that it doesn't just end up getting dominated by, you know, the strongest personality. Um, and so they get together for this. I think it's a long weekend. It's like three days. Um, and they they talk in small groups. They ha they hear the expert witnesses come and talk about the issue. They get to hear sort of, the, you know, the pro and the con um, and then talk amongst themselves until they come up with uh a description of and a recommendation about how to vote on that ballot initiative. So it is very popular in Oregon because it is like they don't have power, right? They they don't get to decide whether the ballot measure passes. They they just get to put something on the ballot about it. Um, but I think it's like in almost every case, people have voted the way that that citizen assembly recommended because it's very trusted that those were. A representative group of people who did not have a uh, you know horse in the race and um and they thought about it a lot and so you you know can sort of trust that you don't have to go and spend an entire weekend becoming an expert on this issue because they did it for you could i respond um i i think it's a great idea um the whole notion of it um in reading the whole book though i I think we we really want to reach out to our young people to get more involved in the whole in this whole process. We 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 try to encourage them to start thinking about becoming leaders in this whole movement. Everything that you're talking about, New Hampshire doesn't have automatic voting um, registration. And, and that's like square one, uh, you know, really, um, and in my mind, um, but, um, but along with everything else, I really, I really like, but, um, you know, it's trying to get in um, the younger people in colleges and maybe even late high school kind of, kind of into this. And I think that, that would be the, the, Goal, I would think the push to to move these these initiatives 
forward. I think, you know, they're our future. So that's, that's. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly yeah. automatic voter registration, especially with the, you know, sort of pre-registration at 16 so that you're tracking them to make sure that um, they get on the rolls automatically at 18 is a very important way of engaging um, youth because, well, especially combined with vote by mail, right? Because if you automatically get on the rolls and then you automatically get a ballot and a, you know, explanation in the mail, all of a sudden you don't have to go and figure out, oh, I turned 18, like now I got to go figure this all out. It, it comes to you and, you know, and it goes back to that feeling of like, oh, I'm, I'm now an adult citizen. I'm involved. They want me, you know, to weigh in on this. That's, you know, how you feel when you, you, you know, get that in the mail. So I think that's definitely the first step for engaging uh, youth. So we're going to pivot because the next question is um, about the Electoral College chapter. So please uh, elaborate on the values and the current status of the interstate compact versus popular vote. If you don't know. Yeah, the compact, uh, the current status is, what is it? It has now, I think most of the blue states, a couple of purple states uh, signed on. And there was kind of a window uh, where red states were really interested too, because they were worried that the popular vote was going to go um, against them. But after the last two elections, unfortunately, that uh, that fear reversed, <laughs> and those red states now have more of a feeling um, that this is not in their interest to sign on to the National Popular Vote Compact. So it has the the movement has kind of hit a um, hit a slowdown um, because of the partisan nature of the politics. So yeah, there was this kind of golden period where there were people on both sides who were like, right, this why you know this doesn't make sense. Of course, people should elect the president, and now it's uh, uh, it's like many things weighed down in the partisan politics. Their questions. Your favorite chapters. Um, I would ask a question. This is sort of paraphrased from uh, a volunteer earlier this week, but uh, your, pub your book was published in 2020. And so is there anything in the interim in between 2020 and today that uh, you would add to the book or any solutions that you would highlight um, based on passage of time? Yes, yeah, certainly I would say that the democracy dollars movement has gained some momentum um, since publication with Tom's book, which I understand you all read, um, and uh, more local campaigns around democracy dollars. So that is um, one that has, I think, you know, picked up more interest um, in the interim. And then the other thing, as I mentioned, um, uh, ranked choice voting has definitely gotten a lot of momentum. So Alaska passed a ballot measure for ranked choice voting. I, New York City, I, maybe they had done it before the book, but they, they uh, have ranked choice voting. And um, uh, Portland passed multi-winner ranked choice voting. And now there are um, a couple of states with ranked choice voting kind of on the radar um, at the state legislative level. So uh, ranked choice voting is definitely kind of having um, a moment more than it was, <laughs> much more than it was when I published. Lois, go ahead. Hey, Kristen. Um, I, I love the uh, Citizen Assembly um, model. I just love it. We are not a home rule state. Every single thing has to go through every single thing. Uh, how our police are managed has to go through a law. We have a very, very powerful legislature and a weak governorship. Uh, so um, given that and the, as you know, Free State Project that decided to move here, we've gone to sort of leaning into an extreme form of libertarianism that sort of matches some of the extremities we heard 
around uh, the 2020 election and the subsequent when January 6, 2021 um, incident. And I'm just wondering how a state like New Hampshire that has been evolving away from the, uh, because we don't have home rule anyway, away from the ideals that something like a citizen uh, assembly springs from can be brought into the light, so to speak. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, not having home rule is certainly tough. Um, <laughs> but it does seem like, you know, if you're moving into more, even more libertarianism that, you um, there's a strong libertarian argument for for home rule, right? I mean, like, what's more libertarian than like leave us alone and let us do what we want to do? Um, and there's potentially potentially a real libertarian appeal to even having a citizen assembly do some watchdogging um, at the state level. So one possibility is seeing if there is kind of like a strange bedfellows coalition um, possibility where maybe there's a group that's like anti-government, right? Anti-government spending or anti-government something. And then you go to them and say, hey, why don't we do a citizens assembly to watchdog on government spending on this issue? Um, and you know, maybe that's not your favorite issue um, that you would want the Citizens Assembly on, but it's a way of getting uh, that experience with the Citizen Assembly that then once people see it at work, maybe it then starts to spark the imagination beyond that, you know, particular issue. I thank you for that idea, but uh, watchdogging spending is a way of life <laughs> yeah, okay. in New Hampshire, <laughs> people and its governments. <laughs> but other, there are other topics that, that that would be good ones that would be good ones so thank you thank you Gripson. Lois I know you're in a city but um we do I am I have it I have a charter that I have to read to see what we could do um <laughs> I don't think we can do a thing but, but I, I think our meeting see. in New Hampshire is a little bit like a citizen assembly when we debate and discuss our budgets yeah <laughs> Yeah, that was, I mean, it's sort of piggybacking on what Lois is implying. We're so cheap, you know, and um, I wrote that in the, when you were talking about Citizens Assembly in Oregon, that was my question, like, well, who's paying for it? Who's funding it? We, we, we can't, we can't pry money out of the state for anything that I've been, you know, so anyway, so who pays for it? How does that work? Yeah, the Citizen Assembly in Oregon, the first year it was paid for by a foundation um, to sort of prove it. And then it proved so popular that there was a lot of pressure on the legislature to fund it. So they did. But part of the reason that it has moved from every two years to every four, of course, is because the legislature then was like, oh, maybe like we'll fund it less. So. Well, how much is it? How much does it cost? Um, You know, I, I used to know that number, but I don't have it on the top of my head, but I could definitely connect you with um the the people in Oregon who run it. Ursula. Unmeeting my dogs, thank you. Um, uh, Kristen, thank you. I, this is like, a, it's, it's like a great how-to manual. Um, I'm in New Hampshire as well. What do you, what, is there a single approach here that you see as a good low hanging fruit starting point? Because we're old, we're white, and we're cheap. <laughs> uh, what, uh, you know, I'm reading all this going, yeah, great idea, great idea, great idea. Oh, they'll hate this. I, yeah, I mean, I feel like the lower hanging fruit is Eric. It, it does cost money to join. So it's, I know, I know. But 
it's not that much. It's it's like by um by registered voter. Um, so it would be, you know, less for New Hampshire. Um and it's it is this kind of nonpartisan sell, right? That you're saying, hey, are you worried about voter fraud? This is the solution. Um, are you worried about government corruption? You know, this is the solution. So I feel like there is this cross ideological um, appeal to it. And yeah, I, I, it does cost money. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I'm fine with that, but there are people in this state who would be proud to keep money in the bank rather than replacing a leaky roof. Right, yeah. And the good news is uh, Representative Angela Brennan has sponsored the Eric bill and will hear, have hearings starting in January about that. Um, and it's not that much, $25,000 for New Hampshire to join the program to keep a clean checklist. But the problem is, is the conservatives in our state don't like it because it ha you have to mail a postcard to every unregistered voter. And they're just scared that people will have to register to vote. Um, so we just need to, to really say that that's not scary. That's part of democracy. Well, well, Scared that people will have to register to vote or scared that people will be able to register to vote? Oh, yeah, we yeah. will register to vote, yes. <laughs> Got it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the gerrymandering chapter? Uh, yeah, sure. So gerrymandering, this I think was one of the things that I uh, got. <laughs> it's I, I feel like there, you know, people know what gerrymandering is now, like we're, they probably didn't 10 years ago, but now it's it's more kind of in the common parlance. Um, but it is frustrating to me that it's one of the issues that people kind of understand and hate and, you know, can get real worked up about. But it often feels to me like people just go around and around the bush around the solutions because the, the single member districts are like water, right? They're like the water we swim in. And so people can't even look that gerrymandering might just be an inherent problem with single winter districts. So they just like assume the single winter districts and then are trying to figure out like, how do we fix gerrymandering? Like, can we do it with an algorithm? You know, can we do it with a commission? Can we do it with bipartisan work? And like, none of that really works because what you need to do is not have single winner districts so it's one of those issues where like we thought a lot about like oh this is a good hook because people know this problem right and so then we can start talking to them about the solution but getting people from the problem of gerrymandering to the solution of multi-winner races was like it was it's like it's a big gulf um which is hard <laughs> and uh, and frustrating, but it is part of why I'm so excited about the Portland initiative. Like it it won, you know, and we're we're gonna have uh, some something to show for that and something to show for like how how that works. Uh, you know, another you know kind of in that we we tried with a single winner districts was, you know, there were. Um, court cases from like the 70s where the um, the solution, the court ordered solution to Voting Rights Act violations was multi-winner districts with cumulative voting. Um, and that that was a thing that happened for a while. And then it kind of went to this solution of, no, you just have to draw a majority minority district, which is what, you know, has just happened um, um, recently in uh where is it? North Carolina? That just happened. So that was also frustrating that we thought if courts could start again, at least like saying that you could draw a minority majority district or you could draw a multi-winner district with a fair voting method, um, that that would like start to reintroduce it into the conversation. But um, 
we haven't gotten a, a recent court ruling like that. So it's a it's a tough it's a tough issue to to figure out how to come at it when it's a little bridge too far for people and there's you know not a lot of ways of getting at it. Other questions? Go ahead, Lo oh, go ahead, Lois. Anybody else? Because I've already gone. Anybody? No. Um, Kristen, I, I'm asking this because I'm very interested that you come from a state that is trying to do what one of your chapters talks about, which was create its own separate self and go over to Idaho. And so I'm I'm wondering if it has helped that Oregon has been able to initiate some of these uh, citizen assembly. Did, has anything helped to bring into a sense of belonging the people in East Oregon that want to go into West Idaho because they don't feel like they belong. Has anything helped to bridge that at all? Oh, yeah, that's such a tough uh, cultural issue that the there's just, a, I mean, not everyone, right? But there are a lot of people in Eastern Oregon who just feel so strongly that, you know, the state government is just captured um, by the liberals west of the Cascades and they're, um, you know, put upon and their their voice isn't heard. But I think it's like a very vocal minority that feels that kind of victim mentality, you know, of the the Bradys who are like, how dare you not let me, you know, graze my animals on federal land. Um, I'm so put upon, right? Um, but I would say that there are other, you know, people who live in those areas and are conservative who um don't feel that way, you know, because Oregon is very inclusive um, in the the way that we let people have a voice, you know, and like in that the the citizen assembly um, and all of that. So, I don't know. It's 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 also hard though, because you know everything's so identity polarized these days that uh, the more that somebody identifies with like this is who I am, and so even just the fact that you know the capital is in Salem, you know, west of the Cascades is. Um, just in and of itself can be proof that your identity is being disrespected. So it's. But you have been able to um, encourage some who were a little bit uh, felt like they had been shunted aside and not paid, that they are back feeling like they, they are participating at this point. Yeah. And I think the fact that, that, you know, so far that the efforts to join Idaho have not gained a lot of um, momentum is you know, in some ways uh, speaks to that people do feel like Oregonians um, and they do feel included um, and they, you know, that they don't, they aren't like, yeah, uh, you know, woe is me, let me go over to another state. So, uh, you know, hopefully it's some of that is um, uh, making people feel, you know, part of the, the bigger state, even if they don't agree with everything that happens in Salem. I'm hoping that's true for New Hampshire too. We're very polarized here right now. More, I I lived here just about all my life, and I'm 76 and have never seen New Hampshire the way it is now. Never. We had uh, parties that differed and got along mostly. Um, so mostly, 100. percent But but when I say libertarian, I also should add um, Florida. Thou shalt not tell me what to teach. Mentality has set into to go to the really extreme edge of, I don't know what you call that, but I wouldn't exactly put it with the traditional libertarian thought. So we're very polarized. And I was hoping to hear that if you do the citizen assembly, it puts some of these like really alarmed people pushing back and saying, that's not who I am. That's not who we are in New Hampshire. Bring them back in and, and, reassure that the, this is democracy working. Yeah, I would say definitely the people who participate in that. And there was, you know, the, the Oregon Citizens Assembly is a pretty small group of people, but there was this sort of bigger experiment of um, 
Americans, Americans in one room. That was like a citizen um, poll. You know, they didn't have any decision making authority, but it was just to sort of like talk with people who are different than you. And um, and they had a lot of success in people changing their mind, you know, on issues after they actually talk to a real human being um, on the other side of the issue and people feeling like, oh, th these are human beings, you know, like I, I can't demonize all people like this anymore because I've had to actually speak with one. Um, so I think there are some things like that that are not, you know, di directly like the decision making in democracy, but are more like um, citizen building right of mm. of of feeling like uh i'm a i'm an oregonian or i'm an american and you're you are too <laughs> and you're not you know you're not the devil just because you you know disagree with me on things that's what we need thank thank you Kristen. i love that citizen building mm. um thank you so much for your amazing book and for joining us tonight we're gonna join into breakout rooms and discuss amongst ourselves and come back with solutions and we'll sh we'll make sure to share with you ideas that we come for actions at the end of tonight but thank you so much for being with us and I will open breakout rooms um, for everyone to join well, great Kate do you want to start with your group no we were group three so I want to not start with us. <laughs> I think our group was group one. And um, Linda suggested we need hopeful strategies. Um, and this book is a reference guide for those hopeful strategies. Um, Joan suggested that we have we need the information and knowledge as a starting point. I loved her idea of like getting this book to local libraries and getting other people to read it for knowledge um, but we also need people willing to devote their time and energy towards getting the word out to build a citizens movement mm -hmm. um, and bob added we have to get in good trouble we can't be afraid to be our own little john lewis's to get in trouble <laughs> and Karine suggested from our you know we also need to believe we can win because yeah. we also have to have that hope that motivates us to keep going so those were the solutions that came from our group or ideas. Yep. Group two. Lois, Anita, or Sue, does anyone want to talk about what we talked about? <laughs> All me? Okay. <laughs> um, well, I didn't take notes, so this is totally off the top of my head. Um, we talked about uh, the power of voting from home and how it makes things more accessible. Um, those of us in the group who are or were poll workers um, talked about how helpful it would be to have automatic voter registration. Um, and since some of us are from New Hampshire and some of us are from California, we contrasted um, some of the different solutions in the book in terms of like how doable it would be in New Hampshire versus California, what California already has in place, um, and yeah, which solutions just make uh, voting a lot easier. And what we can learn from our other states, right? Probably not uh, Wisconsin, though. <laughs> and uh, Anita, I'll I'll ask you to give your idea of the community centers because you're the one who articulated it so well as a starting place to get community people involved. Did, would sure. you do that? Yeah, thanks, Lois. Um, so my my idea, only because I've, um, through um, work experience, I've had some connections with the community action agencies throughout the entire state. Um, they're they're very vital and they really connect to um, their, their neighbors um, in their different locales. And, and the thought was to um, provide a presentation at, at each of those that um, talked about maybe this, the idea of um, voting from home, voter registration, 
Um, and um, remind me if there was another one um, we were talking about, um, but uh, um, but but they they might be the um, the the key points to to kind of get the word spread um, and start that happening. Um, and uh, so that that was the thought. And and it was it was a, a, a trying to bring a positive counter to all the um, all the right. talk of fraud and cheating and criminality at, that has been attached so strongly by the minions of Trump and Trump himself to voting from home that it has actually gotten into people's uh, psyches here as a fact. I find that when I'm phoning for candidates, I hear that more than I ever believed I possibly could, that they, they're questioning uh, the, the safety of the ballot if it comes in any other way but in person, more than I ever, ever heard. And this this was a great idea from Anita to start a, an opportunity to start a grassroots positive yeah. conversation. Well, what we need, what I'm thinking is we need to thwart this um, effort to create these conspiracies of, oh, this will happen if we do um, at home voting and, and so forth and so on. And you can just imagine where it all springs from, or, or you can't actually imagine where it comes from, but, but in, a, in a community action agency setting, it's such a um, solid piece of the community. And it, it's a vital piece of the community in, in New Hampshire. And I, I just think they're they're great. They, they really help residents in uh, where they are. And um, so I don't think you'd have that much going on in, or be able to you'd be able to tamper that down possibly. But you have that trust and that relationship. Yes. Yep. That's so critical, right? Yes, exactly. From our last group. That does segue for us. Actually, we spent quite a lot of time talking about community and it started with something Gordon has started to do um, this summer. Just goes into the supermarket, the cashier, and you can probably say it better than me, but just sort of like, he'll ask them, how are you feeling on a scale of zero to 10? And he, did, he thinks that's like, somebody's going to think that's a really intrusive question. He said, but he gets answers. Somebody will say, yeah, 7.8, but I'm going to go home and eat dinner and it's going to be an eight. And somebody says five. So he described something recently that happened with as a, um, well, Gordon, I'm going to let you just take it for the RV thing. But before that, I'm going to say another thing that Piggy was back more um, to what you're saying, Anita, is he started to talk about how in his town, there's a community board that's actually, you know, authorized by a state RSA, but, and it brings people together around cornhole or that they collect buttons, but it is an opportunity to say to that, to, it addresses what Kristen was saying. The underlying thing is people need to know they matter. They need to know they belong. At, and in New Hampshire, the community level, and this is what you're saying too, is a really important place to do that. And he says, you know, if you're building something together and I'm holding the nail and you're holding the hammer, we're not polarized in that moment. We might be polarized in some other moments, but we're not in that. And and so we need to use those opportunities. So it did swing to a bigger issue. And so Gordon, if you'll just tell that little bit about the guys and what that guy said, and then what that led to for our little talking group. Yeah, I just, uh, it was, a, I was at a cashier in Ashland, New Hampshire. I asked the zero to 10 question. Uh, the fellow at the, at the, who was the cashier said, I'm like a seven, but I'd be in nine and a half if I could get housing and I could stop living in my RV. And uh, I work in my full time and my wife works full time. And this is a huge problem, you know, it's just, and then there were other people around and uh, th they were, <laughs> uh, they were not liberals, but there was a huge consensus that this, this is a, this is, this is the hot button issue. And so, uh, you know, 
maybe uh and someone said i, I can't remember who, who said it but uh i like this idea of maybe this is a strange bit yeah. around this issue a strange bedfellows moment and maybe we should look for those certainly housing i think is yeah uh, and so that's what we were saying is that this is one that is right now bringing strange bedfellows together in new hampshire um and it's therefore it is a moment and as, as i was saying it can go this way um where you can begin to work together we're starting to see it in peterborough or the magnet a part way and it's going to be doing both because it's pretty delicate but i do think there's um this is a moment a strange bedfellows moment that we should be thinking about and and uh developing so uh, gordon would you um what what is the question you're asking people at the cash register or uh, <laughs> just how they how they are on you know, a scale uh, just on a scale how how are you how are you doing today on a scale of you know contentment happiness zero to I mean, I, you know zero is you know suicidal and ten is nirvana uh, <laughs> this um uh in part comes from when I was in college, we had this, we, we had a three part scale. One of it was uh, horniness of zero to 10. Oh, um, hear us. But that's no longer relevant um, <laughs> for 70 year old, eight year olds like me. Um, but you know, it's, it's, a it's an interesting, um, you know, it, I was just surprised and I did read, I must have, I read an article that was about this whole loneliness issue and, one of the points that really struck me in this article very quickly is that they said not only uh, are connections with people you know and meet regularly important, but it's quite important to connect with people who you don't know. That that a, a casual a conversation when you're sitting on a park bench with somebody, uh, with your dog or watching some that's that can be an antidote to, to loneliness. Um, you know in addition to, you know, more permanent, um, and that that's a big, loneliness is a really big issue, I think, everywhere. And it's really unconnections, what it is. So I suggested to Gordon that because he's already got this mechanism, um, that maybe there would be a way to use a sort of a, and, and they're, they're actually a, um, a recognized board uh, from the town that if he wanted to learn more about doing citizens assembly, sort of the way she described it, they could probably do that in Antrim. They could probably get postcards out to everybody and figure out the algorithm and have a citizens assembly on something. Um, yeah. could, could, so it could be, because that's when we started to go back, I said, that brings us to the concept that she has of laboratories, you know, lab, a laboratory town, a laboratory, uh, situation that like look what they did over there you know if we can learn from each other that way it could be kind of powerful things could spread a little bit the other thing i said was i really understood from her book in a way that i hadn't before how rank choice voting could really break open this log jam um and i said i'm gonna even start doing it in things like you know the book club <laughs> you know rank choice voting but her ballots so me that struck me again as sort of a low hanging fruit that we can begin to exercise in in some settings and again maybe somebody will convince their town to do it and then it can become a laboratory that way i don't I have no idea but um that was one of my takeaways i was like huh okay i'm going to pay more attention to how we could main yeah. it you know so rank choice about the friday night pizza order with your family exactly yeah <laughs> yeah that's right you hook them in with cornhole and then you get them to you know ballot initiatives right <laughs> <laughs> so pizza to hmm, yeah it's a great example so i want to thank everyone for coming tonight it's such a rich discussion about really how we build community right we're going to become a democracy or if we when when we build a, a more robust and rich community. So um, there is a form that Sarah put in the chat that I hope you all can add book suggestions to. 
Um, and Joe, do you want to take us away of of uh, ideas for next year? <laughs> ah, well, for next year, we uh, I think we should continue our theme of uh, where are we, how did we get here, and what are we going to do about it. Uh, this this book, by the way, of the I think you said fifteen so far we we've, we've read. Uh, this is the clearest example of things we can do, or at least can uh, attempt to do. Uh, so let's let's keep that in mind. Although if people have suggestions uh, for other major themes that we might uh, want to take up. We're certainly open to suggestions. And we're always open to uh, uh, suggestions for specific books 